Hello, everyone. Well, <laughs> any one of the descriptions for Authors Boot Camp. This is going to be so much fun. Now, if you're watching on YouTube and you're not live with us, that's okay. But if you want to join us live in a future day, 9 to 9.30 a.m. in the link in the description, there'll be a Zoom link and you can join us for the next five days as we do this. So for day one, it's all about getting your subscription started. I wanted to cover three short foundational things. Each day, we're going to have three short foundational learnings, literally like a sentence or two sentences to keep in mind for that day. Then I want to open it up and talk about your answers to these exercises live. And ultimately, I bet that out of the 20 people here, some of you have started your subscription. Maybe some of you know you want to do it, but some of you might be on the fence. Some of you might not be sure how you want to do your subscription. And I want you to start thinking about this now because I want to have you come up and ask me, tell us your situation, share this, your story, so we can help you. Okay, so that's kind of the live workshop aspect here. But what are the three things I want you to know? about getting started with subscriptions. What are the three things? The first thing is what are subscriptions? Which some of you might be confused by it because like we subscribe to so many things, right? We subscribe to, uh, you know, maybe cable, maybe you cut that for Netflix. We subscribe to the water. Technically we pay our utility bills each month, at least in the States, that's how it works. Um, you know, you subscribe to different software, you subscribe to, sometimes food subscriptions. I mean, everything's a subscription now. There's other book subscriptions. You can subscribe to something like Audible and get a new credit each month. You can subscribe to KU and get access to a million books, which I highly doubt you'll be able to read in one month, but go for it. That is a lot of stuff with really descriptions, but that's not what we're talking about today. Subscriptions for authors are a recurring payment that a reader makes directly to you, the author, in exchange for access to content, so backlist, early access to stories, maybe bonus content, maybe they're signed books, maybe it's a book club or other digital experiences. I know we have um, Victoria Sue here who does a lot of incredible things in that regard for her subscription. So that's just a, a primer. And it's important to remember that when we talk about subscription subscriptions for others, it's a payment that a reader is making directly to you to support you, to get access to what you're doing. And it helps you build a subscription business where you're getting paid each month consistently, sustainably. That's the goal. I'm going to try and get you there. Okay. So what is the learning number two? Learning number two is there's no right or wrong goals to have your subscription. Me and Amelia are like the biggest believers on this in the world. Like we're never going to tell you there's one way to have a successful subscription. It just, there isn't. There's so many different types of authors who are exceeding in different models and different genres. Me and Amelia don't know it all. No one knows it all, but together we can learn. Together, we can grow our CUNYs. Together, we can hopefully achieve our dreams as authors. So that's just one big thing. And some authors, they do early access in their subscription. It becomes the core of their business if they're writing on serial fiction platforms. Other authors are doing book boxes, and it's also a big revenue stream for them. Other authors, it's not really a core part of their business, but it's just for some maybe side income. Uh, maybe for some authors, it's not even about the money, but more just connecting with your fans. All of these are valid things. All of these are valid things. And we want you to think about them today. Like, why are you doing this? Why are you here at 9 a.m. if you're in the East Coast, whatever time it is for you? Why did you show up here? And that's not a rhetorical question. I would love to like actually hear that answer in the chat. And in just one moment, because I have one more point, I'm going to open up to you all to start sharing that. Because if we don't know why we're here, like that, that's the most important thing. That's what will ground us, get us through not only these next five days, but the next months and years as we grow our subscription. So the last point, the last point, this is the final point, is that the currency of subscriptions is trust. And I will argue that the currency of almost everything is trust, it's just anything. And especially in publishing, when we are trying to build a business that relies on readers coming back over and over again to read new stories from us, those same readers, right? If we're just constantly getting new readers, uh, we're going to be in a treadmill or a hamster wheel, however you want to look at it, that is probably unsustainable. I shouldn't even say probably, it certainly is. So how do we get readers to keep coming back to our stories? I mean, first things, write great stories. But in the context of subscriptions, we're going to talk a little bit more, especially when we get into the launching in the future about how we can actually keep fans, right? But in general, as we approach these next couple of days, as we approach your future as a subscription author, I want you to keep it sustainable. When we talk about benefits, when we talk about 
um, how much you should be putting into it. The, this is designed for you to be able to do in just a couple minutes a day. And in fact, I guarantee you, by the time you wrap up today or short after it, you will have already completed day one of the Scriptions for Authors Bootcamp. You don't need to spend hours and hours today going through day one. So that's that's the goal, to make it sustainable, make it easy for you. So that, that's the, the intro to day one. Hopefully the primer, uh, the lecture, if you will, many, 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 because no one has time for 45 minutes a day, five days in a row. Um, I want to give it to you neat and as clearly as possible so that we can get into the good stuff, which is helping all of you. Okay. It's helping all of you. So I do have like a bonus thing in the end where I'll talk about some productivity tips for subscriptions over the next couple of days, but I don't want to do that right now. For the next 15 plus minutes, I want to talk about you all. And specifically, we had the exercises in the group which you are more than welcome to answer here, but I kind of want to do something special since we're all live. I just wanted to ask you, you can feel free to speak up in the mic, anyone can, or in the chat, but my question, my question is pretty simple. What are the pros and cons to you for starting a subscription? And if that feels a little difficult to answer, what are you maybe worried about in starting a subscription? It doesn't have to necessarily be a question for me. It could just be your story and what's going on. And I'd be happy to respond. Maybe it is a specific question. In that case, we're all happy to help. I'm happy to go first because I know what my biggest concern is. And the pro would be interacting with my readers on such a more intimate level that I know exactly what they want and who their favorite characters are, all that great stuff. Um, but my, my con is that I am so busy and we're all in that bucket, right? I am so busy that I'm worried I'm not going to be able to produce content fast enough or with high enough quality to respect the money that they're giving me. Totally. Totally. I, I understand, but just taking a quick poll, like, does that, is, does that, is that something that other people relate to as well? When, when you, when you share that concern, do other people be like, yeah, I feel that too. You can put in the chat. If you don't want to speak up, you don't have to. Uh, okay. Yes. We got a yes. We got two yeses. Okay. Yeah. 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 I'm, I'm with you. Here's what I would say. So I, we run subscriptions for authors. Um, and this is why we did day one focused on why you should start, because I want people to do this, that it'll actually work for them. Like, I'm not interested in you having a subscription that isn't sustainable for you. That's draining you and your life. It's just not, it's not what it's about. So I would say, first of all, um, and I promise I'll get to the positive stuff in a moment, but just as a, just blunt me being honest with you, um, I don't want anyone doing a subscription that, you know, feels like it's taking more from them than they're kind of being given by it. And frankly, probably like if there's a million authors in a room, right? Uh, a small percentage of them are going to probably be fit for subscriptions. Maybe a quarter, maybe a quarter would be a good idea. I don't think every author should be in subscriptions. Now, not every author is in subscriptions for authors Facebook group. The fact that you're here, probably you have predispositions that make you a good fit for subscriptions. Given your concerns though, they're super valid. They're super valid. And I think that when it comes to time, I would look at the goal that you want to set for your subscription, the goal that you have, and kind of come up with three different outcomes. Because when I think of like, is it going to be worth your time? I think about money, honestly. Um, like that's a good metric, but if you don't want to use that metric, use another one. Um, and I would come up with three, three goals there. What is like your actual goal that you want to hit? And by what date? And now all of you are probably going to be thinking, Michael, okay, like how, how long should I set this goal in the future for? It's difficult. We're all at different stages of our career, which I want to ask you kind of what stage are you at your career now? What would you be looking for in terms of like a number of subscribers to join? We're going to talk about the content, your production in just a moment, but in terms of the people joining, what is that, what is that looking like for you? Like what would success look like for you when we get to maybe January 1st, if you're launching like now, if you're launching later then think a couple months after you launch, where would you like to be? That's a question for you directly, JM. <laughs> okay, what would my success look like on January 1st? I would be pretty happy if I was able to sustain 
delivering quality content between now and then. If I had subscribers, which I would hope I'd have a few, that would also be really good. But I think my main goal would be, this is my test between now and January 1st and the busiest season, was I able to provide quality and consistent content? I love it. Now to you, what does consistent mean? Like when you think about consistent, what does that mean to you? Consistent for me is actually a very specific metric. So it would depend upon how much I charge and how much I think is worthy of that. Like if they're spending as much as a, as a novel a month, then I should be giving them a novel novel's worth of content. If they're spending half the cost of a novel, then it should be 15 chapters. Okay. Um, and it doesn't necessarily have to be chapters. It can be backstory. It can be character profiles. But I would want the level of content to make sense for the subscribers. And maybe that's where I'm off. But that's that's what it is for me. I love like that. It's awesome. And, and sorry for like putting you like completely in the hot seat here. But like this is thank you for being open. This is, I think, super helpful for everyone. And I'm actually hearing something that I, I want to just dive into a little bit, which is on the point around quantity of content and pricing, quantity and pricing. So um, one of my biggest beliefs about subscriptions is that it kind of, in a, in a way, divorces actual quantity of content from pricing because quantity and actual perception of value are two different things, um, which I know sounds odd, but I'll use an example your favorite author, who you know is going to be your favorite book ever, might be 300 pages long. You're going to probably be willing to pay more for that. And also second of all, sit down and read it over just, a, I'm, I'm saying a random, but a book that you're not as familiar with, you don't have as much trust with going back to that currency subscriptions being trust. Um, so you're probably willing to pay a little less for the book that you trust less, that you're not sure about yet. And then if that book wins you over, you'll pay more for future books from that author. So one thing about subscriptions is that it's not necessarily targeted to your entire audience always. Like the model that you have, by the way, is a great way of thinking about it. And other authors are listening to this and are like, you know what? I want to price my subscription very similar to my books and my readers are just buying it on a subscription model. You have every right to do that. If that's how you want to run your business, I'm not going to tell you otherwise. But I also am going to give you another option. Oh, shit. Sorry. All right. I'm sorry. No, you're good. You're good, Joanna. Don't worry. Um, I want to give you another option which that other option is that some readers want to get work your work early. Getting your work early before the readers see it is creating more value for them. The fact that they love your book so much and that they trust you is inherently more value than just any other book on the shelf. They might be. I'm saying might because I don't want to make any guarantees to people, but I could point to dozens of authors in the group who are succeeding with this kind of psychology who the readers are actually paying a premium per page per quantity of content. And one of the most dangerous things I think we could get into, especially in an age of, let's say, increasing technological things, I'm not going to even go down that rabbit hole, is that when we put and peg our value, our worth as an author, just to the number of words we're writing, we basically created our own KU. Like we didn't do anything fundamentally different, which is nothing wrong with that. I'm saying you could run that business model and be fine, but I'm giving you an alternative, which would mean that maybe the pressure that you have in yourself, if it's like, I want to charge $5 a month because that feels like good skin in the game for readers, it feels like a good entry level. We recommend that. And you're like, oh, well, that means I got to produce a book a month. I'm telling you, maybe not, maybe not. If you want to do that, go for it. But I don't think you have to. And we've seen many authors succeed on $5 a month with a couple chapters in a month. Um, in fact, I know we have some authors here who already have subscriptions and it would be great if you wanted to share how much you're creating a month and what you're charging. If you're open to it, you could do it in the comments or you could speak live now. You don't have yeah, to. Yeah, yeah. I'll, uh, I'll say something about that. Um, hi, I'm Elizabeth. <laughs> um, so I just wanted to say that when I was doing my tier pricing, I had like the $5 tier, $10 tier, something like that. And then I went ahead and I added a 25, a 50 and a $100 tier. And for each one of those, I, I, this was me shooting for the moon. I didn't expect anything to come of it. And I said in big bold letters, 
These are exactly the same things you're getting for $10. This is just if you're a big fan and you want to help me buy, like, produce audiobooks and buy extra swag and do cool stuff, but you're not getting anything other than the $10 tier people get. And on day one, someone signed up for the $100 tier just because she loves my books and she was like, I'm happy getting the $10 stuff, but I want to give you an extra 90 bucks a month just, just to be here. So... You know, if you if you set some pricing, the worst thing that can happen is no one signs up for that tier, but they might surprise you. So it's not just the readers wanting to get the value for their money because they're getting value from knowing they're supporting an indie author as well. And you can't necessarily understate that. Totally. That's an amazing story. And just one reader at $100 a month is amazing. We're not telling you every reader is going to want to come in at $100 a month or even able to, frankly. Uh, but that's an amazing point. Amazing point. Is that is that helpful? Is that helpful, Jan? That's inspirational. I'm glad. Thank you, Elizabeth, for sharing. I, like, that was... Yeah, that, I've never been called inspirational. It made my day. <laughs> oh, <laughs> that's what this is about. Yay! Well, we had a few questions in the chat, but I wanted to give, because I'll, I'll get to the question in the chat, but I wanted to give someone else a chance if they wanted to come up. What are you feeling about starting your subscription? Pros, cons, fears, laid out for us. Uh, I'll I'll say something, if that's all right. Um, so my dream really is to sort of create a space it's kind of like a mad scientist lab for all of these, uh, you know, I, I do not have a large backlist and I feel like a subscription model very much aligns with the way I would like to en engage with readers, A, and B, um, encounter my author career. Um, just try, just a, a kind of like a place to try things um, create content that then could be turned into novels and sold in, in mainstream distribution channels, but like really have the subscription place be the center of that sort of way to connect with fans and try things out and just, um, and, and beyond just writing, um, but like all the different kind of creative things I like to do, however they manifest, um, it feel that that was what feels comfortable for me. But to James' point, my big fear about like taking that step is that I need to be. I'm pretty clear on like what I want the different tiers to be and like how I would probably roll things out. But it is that concept of like if something catastrophic happens or life gets just super crazy, I want to make sure that I'm providing the value to the people that are are helping to support like um because i i understand access but i don't have like a big fandom or any kind of like following so i would be starting from zero but i want to create a space that where people feel comfortable and like they if they need just a minute to like step out of their real life and and you know, take a deep breath that's a place where they could could come and um in addition to sharing content so it's more of like a a, 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 a space for people and and content pro providing so but my so I have all of this you know all these thoughts kind of moving around but then there's this real like apprehension about taking that leap because I want to make sure I can deliver on that and I guess maybe that's something I, I sort of want it to be perfect from the beginning and I know that it won't be so I'm, I'm hesitating so that's that's where I am I mean amazing to hear and I um I want to recommend a book to everyone if, if y'all like listen to probably everything I've ever created, you've probably heard me recommend this book, but most of you probably haven't, um, which is called The Business of Belonging uh, by David Spinks. You were talking about wanting to like, you know, really build a community, build a space for your fans to come to. And I don't feel like there's a ton of like amazing books on it, but this is an amazing book on it. And it talks about the business behind it. Um, some of it is more applicable to like companies rather than like individual creatives, but there's a lot of really good stuff in here. Like the way that he thinks about community building is more advanced than anyone. So I just want to recommend that book. Um, there's, I could go on a rant about all the different learnings from it, but 
then that'll that'll be easier for now. Um, so yeah, that, that that's that. In terms of getting started and like having this vision, right? You have this vision of what you want it to be. And then today where it's like, you haven't started yet and you know how much work it would take to reach that vision. One really important kind of truism about subscriptions is that subscriptions are about iteration, not about launching. In a true sense, like subscriptions give you a new shot every single month to do something new, to change things around, to make things better. And what I like to think about is this like metric um, that like it's, it's it's a stupid little acronym, but it's TTFD, which stands for time to first dollar. And ideally in subscriptions, you try and get that as low as possible. Like how fast can you get a subscriber on a $5 deal? Which is like, I, we're doing a five day boot camp because I want to prove to you that it's possible. Um, and this is where we like to kind of talk about this concept of like a minimum viable subscription. How are you able to build the the least amount in terms of your benefits, in terms of um, your tiers. You don't need 10 tiers in day one, in terms of your branding, to just see if this is something your readers want. Um, and one of the biggest mistakes I see authors make actually is starting with like five or six different benefits in their tiers, where they're going to be giving bonus content, early access, they're going to be doing live streams, they're going to be doing this and that. And if an author is super passionate and excited, I never discourage you from like doing what you love. That's what this is ultimately about, having fun. But if you're doing all of that under this pressure to think that you need that, I've looked at a list of a thousand subscription author pages that are doing well. And there's a lot less patterns than you'd think. And there certainly isn't that like correlation between, oh, they offer five benefits. In fact, it's the opposite. If you offer too many benefits, no readers are going to be able to keep up with it. And it's actually going to confuse people when they're coming in because they're going to be like, oh, well, it's $5 a month for all of this, but I'm only interested in that one thing. So why am I paying $5 a month if I don't want all the other things, right? So that psychology there kind of can work against you. And then it does another thing. You don't know what your readers are interested in because they sign up and then you're like, oh, well, I guess they wanted everything, but they might not. They might only want one thing. So starting small with one benefit allows you to see, is this something that my readers want or not? And then tweak what you're doing if you don't get the response you want to maybe change your benefit up entirely. Um, and that's why actually starting small is a benefit. And although you have this gorgeous, amazing vision that I want you to achieve, the only way you're going to get there is by taking one step at a time. Thank you. That is very, very helpful. Thank you. Of course, I'm happy to help. Um, I'm going to go rapid fire through some questions in the chat. Do the chapters we release need to be fully edited? Um, no. They don't need to be fully edited. Can we do Ream and Kindle Bell at the same time? Uh, yes, as long as you keep your content behind Ream and a paywall. This isn't due to Ream's rules. We are we function similar to your own website. I mean, it's direct sales. You get the emails of all your readers. That's what's great about subscriptions. But um, you obviously have the rules of Kindle Bell to to um, to manage. Uh, and Kindle Bell basically, to my understanding, I'm not an expert at Kindle Bell, but I've read their TOS. The last time I read it, and I believe this is still updated, just giving these disclaimers because if someone's watching this YouTube video in the future and it's changed, maybe that's changed. But basically, as long as your content is behind a paywall on Ream, that's okay. But if you post those chapters to followers or public on Ream where it's free for people to read, um, that would be breaking Kindle Vela's rules. Um, Kindle Unlimited is completely different. You cannot be on KU and at Ream at the same time. You can't be on KU and anywhere else because KU is completely exclusive to the digital format. Um, so that is uh, great. So I'm going to chicken next day. This is from Andre. How do I get people to subscribe to service before I start publishing books? But I won't. don't want to necessarily start publishing the books until I have a strong community of people who are interested in waiting to read. How do I get into the cycle? So someone who I think of when I hear this story is Brian Michael Hughes. Let me send you all his subscription. Um, take me a moment to pull it up. So... Brian is, I think, at a very similar, I shouldn't say I think, he's at a pretty similar stage to you in your in your career, um, Andre. And um, his page is great. It's good for inspiration. He hasn't, um, I think, he's like officially, like he's definitely published, I think maybe one book, two books, but he's like just really, like he's right at the beginning of his career. Uh, uh, I, I know this because 
um, oh, I'm going to mute you, Ronnie. Um, uh, he was uh, in the first cohort of the accelerator. And when we were, we were going through it, that was like the same. It's like, oh my God, I don't have, um, I don't have the readers. How am I going to get started? Well, you can see now from his page, he has seven paid members and 62 followers. So he definitely has made something work. And a lot of them are actually beyond the 1599 tier. 599 is his cheapest tier. So he's doing pretty well for someone who's really just kind of at the beginning, right? Um, and the biggest thing that he has, and you can see this on his page, is what he's using to bring his community together, creating stories about human greatness and resilience, experience fantastic abilities and stories of triumph and lots of mental twists. He's writing fiction. Okay, he's writing fiction, but his actual CUNY is really based around like, and he could just play it better than me because it's his CUNY. Um, but to my understanding, like depression, and anxiety, helping helping people with that through music, through fiction. And that's kind of what he's bringing people in on. He's open about his mental health journey. Now, you do not need to be open and share your own personal life. Um, I, I, I literally, this, this is what makes these things fun. I could go on for five hours, but there's this thing called author personas that we're going to be releasing. It's totally free. It's totally free quiz, but I'll give you the framework right now in terms of how you can think about building your community at an early stage. I think that all of like community building goes back to the persona you create. I'm going to share another author who I just recommend looking at their page. Jack's persona is incredible. I always like recommend Jack because I think Jack's subscription is amazing. Um, just read their about section and you'll know what I mean. Like, you'll be like, this is different. And you'll see, oh, they're doing well. They got 59 paid members as of the current moment speaking. So they're doing well. The biggest thing that you can have is personas. There's five different types. And, and I know we're past 930, feel free to go. But I, I mean, I always go over on these things. Um, uh, the, the first thing is having the persona based around who you are as a person, a slice of you. This is what we see most outwardly this is what we see 90 percent of authors do but i only think like 10 percent to 20 percent of authors max are actually best suited for this because it makes us uncomfortable to actually you know we write fiction we create these worlds and then we have to put our real selves out into the world do we need that though in the rise of vtubers um, and all the different things that we're seeing across media formats it's definitely not needed so what are what are other ways to think about it because if you want to build a cuny around something and you're the person leading it behind the scenes what is that something so it could be around you and yourself as a person. The quintessential example of this is Christopher Hopper. And I love Christopher Hopper because he's an amazing dude. Um, but you can see someone like Christopher and be like, oh, well, I'm not that. Brian is more doing the model around him, right? But there's four other ways to think about it. One is doing the model based around a made up version of who you are. Totally fictionalized. You're not going to ever share pictures of yourself. It's like a pen name, but you might already have pen names. But the actual character is an author like the author is a character too does that make sense you characterize yourself um which can seem disingenuous but i don't think it is i think is if you're passionate about what you're doing and that's more comfortable for you there's no reason you can't do that authors forever have lived behind pen names now the the meaning of pen names evolving as this industry is evolving and i think we can go even further with it um the third thing is making a kini based around your character right? Maybe people are coming there because of your characters. The fourth thing is making a community based around your world, right? Fantasy, epic fantasy specifically is obviously the prototypical of this, um, but it could work in other genres too, especially like small town romance. Maybe the world, the town is the, is the thing. Um, and then the last one, I have to get my bearing straight around all the ones I've shared so far, because um, I don't have my notes for author personas in front of me right now. Um, but I'm going to get them up right now because I'm blanking on the last one. Um, this is what's fun about live and slightly off the cuff is the expert. Okay. Yeah. This is the one that's not important for fiction authors uh, being like an expert. Um, so like, you know, I guess an example of that would be like, I don't share much of my personal life in the Facebook group, um, but we definitely have a community and I try and share my insights, but like, you know, and I'm happy to be open about things, but you're not necessarily knowing like what I ate for breakfast or um, my my latest, you know, whatever is going on in, in my personal life. It's more focused on my knowledge as it pertains to an industry. And that's not as important for fiction authors, but I do have an example of someone who's doing it, a science fiction author named Elliot Pepper. Um, but he has a totally different business model, right? He's like consulting for tech companies and using his science fiction as a funnel into it. There's a lot of different opportunities for fiction authors. So what does that mean for you? One, I would try and figure out what your persona is just in general, because I think that's helpful. And two, the chicken and egg problem, like 
I I don't think anyone has an audience for their first book. I know my first book, I had a few family members buy, and then it was just crickets. It was just crickets. I don't think you should stop not having an audience from getting your first book out because your first book, your first subscription, it feels like a really big moment. And it is a really big moment. It's a huge accomplishment, but it's not going to make or break you. It's not going to make or break you. We're not in the trad world. If you are planning to go traditional publishing, this is different, but you don't have publishers backing your backing your six-figure advance where if you don't pay it out, you're dead and you'll never get a contract ever. Like this is different. This is about the long game here. And I don't think you need to worry about not having fans in the door because what's going to create fans is releasing your work. Ultimately, is that amazing story. And if you're holding it back from them in, in the fear that you won't have fans, I think that you could be shooting yourself in the foot. Oh, this is a good point, Elizabeth. So Elizabeth says, if you do use a characterized pen name, do be careful if you're not forcibly representing a minority. It was a big scandal a few months ago where a trans woman had author had gotten very close and personal to and befriended a lot of authors in the LGBT community. Turned out it was a straight guy who took it way too far and a lot of people felt the straight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think being being authentic in the version of a pen name you put out is important. And I also think that like, uh, I know a few authors who do this. Obviously, I'm not going to share their names, but behind the scenes, they actually are their real person, right? Behind the scenes, when they're working with other authors, when they're working with their other, they're not pretending entirely, a lot of these people, but it's just the persona to the readers. Um, so it's kind of like, you know, an actor stepping onto stage, right? Except you're not acting, you're not going on stage, et cetera. Um, sometimes it's more comfortable for people to think about it that way. If it's not, if it's still super weird, don't worry about it. It's all good. Um, I just know a lot of people have felt the other thing is weird where it's like, I have to put myself out there. I don't want to put myself. It's like, well, we could put an aspect of yourself and package it up into a character and a story, which is what you're really good at anyways. So yeah, that is uh, whew, that is a lot. Uh, I tell you, we get a lot done in a half hour. Um, I know I didn't get to all the questions. It'd be very difficult in just a half hour to do that. But I hope this was a good primer. I would love your feedback on how this went. Um, I want to share three brief tips on um, productivity for creative people as we go through these next couple of days. And then we're going to end it literally by 940. We started only five minutes late. So I only went five minutes late for the actual live part of it. So I feel pretty good about that. But we'll we'll stick to keeping these things a half hour. I want to respect y'all's time. So um, what are the three productivity tips I have for you? Um, most of this isn't going to be news to you, but I want to bring it into the context of subscriptions. So first of all, for a lot of creative people, not everyone, but for a lot of creative people, myself included, deadlines are actually a superpower because they give you the pressure, the kick to kind of keep going. So if you're just getting started in subscriptions, you're not sure if this is going to be good for you. Sometimes deadlines can be a really powerful thing to help you remain consistent. And that's one of the really key things about a subscription because you have this sort of commitment you've made to your readers. So that can help. Now, for some people, that'll stress them out. And if it stresses you out, that's okay. There's not one productivity advice for everyone. But I think that could be a useful tip to think about in terms of subscriptions. How can you use this to your advantage, right? How can you use that as something that can help you write more, write better, and have more fun at this? Second thing, and I, I, I saved kind of the main point for later, but I touched on this a little bit earlier, which is consistency doesn't always mean consistent every day, every week. So when thinking about your benefits, you don't have to say, oh, a chapter a week, or I'm going to release a chapter every Monday. You could do that, but if you do that, you 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 don't want to overpromise under deliver, right? You want to stick to it. Imagine if I had like uh, told you like we're gonna do a live stream every day, um, but we're gonna do it at ten a.m. and I show up at eleven a.m. Like that that'd be weird. It would be better if I just didn't give you a time and then we just did this randomly, which wouldn't be very convenient, but it would at least be better than you sitting here with nothing, um, expecting me to be there. So if you aren't able to kind of, if consistency is kind of hard to conceptualize. Like, oh my God, doing this on the same time every day. Don't think about it that way. I work in bursts. Like I, I'm not very consistent in most of the things I do. Um, I, I think a lot of creative people are. So if you're like me, that's okay. What you can then do is say once a month, I do this or be a little bit more vague about your benefits, especially in the beginning. And then as you get a little bit more of a handle on it, maybe build up a backlog, you can start to, if you want, be a little bit more clear in your promises. But as long as you're, giving stuff to your readers when you get to it, it can be okay. So consistent means different things to different people is the bottom line. Maybe consistency for you is every day at this militant time and that's beautiful. Maybe for you, consistency is more like 
you're going to get three of these a month. I just don't know when they're going to come in a month. It'll be a surprise for both you and me. Um, the last point is if you're anything like me, uh, and this is, I think, almost all creative people, you have a lot of ideas. And part of what's exciting about subscriptions is all the different ideas you can have, but it's also overwhelming. And if you do all the ideas at once, all your different experiments that you want to do in your publishing business, you're suddenly not going to have any time to write. So here's my advice. When you create a new tier, you can create a new tier and see if readers sign up and validate demand for different experiments you have. Oh, you want to do character art? Create a character art tier. If no one signs up for it, maybe you don't do the character art. <laughs> You want to do merch? Okay. If people sign up for the merch tier, you figure out the merch after. You can actually develop the product and subscriptions after you develop the tier and accept payment for it. So the best thing about subscriptions, it de-risks your experiments and channels your creativity better. So I hope this is all helpful just in thinking about the next five days. Okay. It's going to be super, super fun. This was the intro. Here's what we have coming up. Day two tomorrow, same place, same time. We're going to be talking all about planning your subscription. Day three is going to be about actually creating it. Day four is launching it. And day five is the future. I hope to see you all there. Um, this recording is going to be up on YouTube like super soon. So feel to sh share it with friends. The post is in the Facebook group, the exercise that we had. Continue the conversation there. Boot camp's beginning. We're so excited to have you all with this. Whether you already have a subscription or whether you're just getting started, we're here to help you grow it and here to help you take everything to the next level. Thank you for participating. All these are going to be super interactive. Hope to see you all next time. And in the meantime, don't forget, storytellers rule the world. See you all soon. Bye, everyone.